Welcome everyone to the Tulsa Dynet User Group. Tonight, David Giard is here to talk with us about blood, sweat, and code reviews. David, thank you very much for being here tonight. I really greatly appreciate it. And if I'm not mistaken, you are in Chicago. I am. How is Chicago? Chicago is beautiful. Beautiful city. Coming That's up awesome. on a really nice time. Come to Chicago in the summer. It's one of the great cities in the world. That, that sounds awesome. And I have seen your pictures. Um, he will do like a daily ride, and he shares the pictures that he takes along the ride. And apparently, as big as Chicago is, he's like never taken a, a trail ride twice because the pictures are just phenomenal and they're almost like never duplicate right it was just amazing sights there in chicago so uh david thank you so much for being here i'm gonna let you uh introduce yourself and then take it from there oh thanks very much sean um by the way if uh if during this presentation if there's any questions put them in the chat window i may or may not see it but i'm going to rely on sean to check that out and he just for for less chaos Sean can interrupt me if there's a question that's uh, relevant in the middle of it. Um, I'm going to talk about code reviews today. I better jump to this slide here. This is me. My name is David. I work for Microsoft. Uh, I'm coming up on my 10-year anniversary in a few months. And um, I've been, uh, I used to run a user group in Southfield, Michigan when I lived there. And uh, so it's really exciting for me to get back into the post-pandemic flow of user groups, even though there's no Chick-fil-A for me, which I'm, I got to talk to somebody about that. But um, we are going to talk today about code reviews right here. And we're gonna start with the story of Jack. Jack is a software developer and he spent days building a software component. He tested it and he double checked his code, made sure that it met all the requirements. He was, when he was satisfied that it worked properly, according to the requirements he was given, he checked his code into source control. A few weeks later, a new version of the software that included his code was released to production and a user found a bug and tweeted about it. So word got back to Jack. He tested it and realized, oh, there's some edge case that he hadn't really considered. It wasn't hard to fix, he fixed it. A couple of hours work, checked in his code, pushed it out and it went to production. It was all good. At least he hopes so. He's hoping for the best, he pushed it out there. This is Joe. Joe is a software developer and Joe spent days writing a software component and he tested it and he double checked his code until he was satisfied that it worked properly according to the requirements that he'd been given. And he checked it into source control. But before it went to production, Joe's team had a policy that required a code review prior to merging any code into the main branch of source control. And during that code review process, one of Joe's peers pointed out a bug in his code. It was an edge case that Joe hadn't considered. He told Joe about it and he fixed it and checked his changes back into source control. The peer checked it again and decided this is good. This is good code. And it went into production. It went as released as uh, uh, a few weeks later to the public. Nobody tweeted about problems with Joe's code. So we're gonna talk a little bit about today about <clears throat> the difference between Joe's situation and Jack's situation. Uh, certainly we would everyone agree that Joe's situation was better. We caught a bug before the public found out about it. Um, but we'll talk a little about why it's better and how that process works. And if it is better, why isn't everybody doing it? And uh, and if it's just because it's better, is it is it perfect? Are there ways that we can make it better? Are there challenges that we can overcome? We'll talk about all that stuff. Before we do, I want to have a couple of definitions here because some people mix up these terms. And so I'm just going to give you my definition of change set, change list, and pull request. As a developer, I write some code. This could be a bug fix. It could be a new feature, really just about anything. Any, any changes that I make to existing code is a change set. It's a set of changes. A change list is the description of those changes. So that if someone else wants to know what was changed in this change set, they have some documentation about it. And a pull request is a request to merge that change set with the main branch in our source control system. Uh, a lot of people, including me, sometimes use those interchangeably. So I want to throw those definitions out. And if I do mix one with the other one, please, I apologize in advance. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about, this will be reviewed for a lot of folks here because I think a lot of you are using, doing uh, 
uh, code reviews already, but so this is how it works. And I, I also, I, I created some cool slides, so I want to show those off. Uh, there's two parties in a code review process. There's the code author and there's the code reviewer. And it starts when the code author writes some changes. They, they, they create a change set and then a change list to go on with that. They document that and they submit a pull request. And the request is, as I said, it's to it's a request to merge that code with the main branch. So that code when it's, when it's in the it's in the source control system, but it's not officially part of the main branch, so it can't go to production yet. There's a gatekeeper, and that gatekeeper is the code reviewer. Code reviewer looks at the change set, she looks at the change list that describes it, and decides is it good enough. And if it is, great, thumbs up, merge it with the main branch. But if not, she will document things that need to be addressed before it can be merged, and she will send it back to the code author, who then will look at her comments and address each one of them, either make the appropriate changes or say, hey, that's not a bug, that's a feature or whatever. They, they, some, somehow they have, the code author has to address that. And then once they've addressed these all these com these comments, then the code author will send it back for another review cycle. And this ping-ponging back and forth goes on until the code reviewer says, yep, thumbs up, this is good enough, go ahead and merge that with the main branch. Uh, why do we do this? There's a bunch of reasons why we want to validate the code, we want to share knowledge, increase ownership, help us make engineering decision, address some weaknesses. Uh, yeah, I've got slides on each one of these. Let me come up this here. Um, number one thing, I think this is the first thing that people think of. We do a code review to validate that it does what it's supposed to do. And when we think about validating code, that's usually what we think about externally. The code, there, there's a bug to fix. Did the developer fix that bug? Or there's a new feature to add added. Is the new feature implemented? And that is important. And that is part of the code review process, probably the first part. Um, but there's more to it that when we talk about validating code, there are internal things. So for example, there may be guidelines. Your organization may have guidelines around things like um, coding standards or you know, does it adhere to those coding standards? Um, is it uh, the naming conventions, the file locations, the, the, the size of the classes, things like that. So we wanna validate that. Uh, we also want to check for any potential problems. Maybe it does what we've asked it to, but we realize, wow, there's there's a problem here. You know, maybe it's using a lot of memory. Maybe it'll uh, if there's a lot of users call this library simultaneously, it could potentially break down. Uh, things like that. Um, and even if everything works correctly and it, it's scalable and it's uh, it uh, we don't see potential problems in it, it still could be improved. It may, for example, maybe there's a more efficient way to do it. Maybe there's something that could, a way of rewriting the code that could make it run faster. Things like that. So there's all sorts of things that the reviewer has the potential to validate beyond just did the, the author make the code do what they were asked to make it do. All right, so that's one, validate code. Uh, another one that we don't often think about is this idea of sharing knowledge. Just by virtue of a reviewer looking at somebody else's code, they're going to absorb some more knowledge about the system, about the business rules about, of the system, about what, the way the code base is implemented to, um, to, to do those, those business rules, to, uh, about the technology being used. They may, uh, uh, if, if they want to see some of the patterns that are, that are being used in there, the libraries that are being used, the language, sometimes reviewers aren't that familiar with a particular language, um, this is a chance for them to get more knowledge. And the more people that have knowledge on a system, uh, the less vulnerable it is. Because I don't know about uh, about you, but every organization I've been, when I was a software developer, they would assign a hypothetical bus to each one of the developers. And that hypothetical bus would hypothetically run over me in all these management meetings. You know, what are we going to do when Dave gets hit by the bus? You know, who's going to take over the system? Who even knows about the system besides Dave? Uh, sometimes if it was a nice place, it would be the hypothetical lottery ticket. What are we going to do when Dave wins the lottery? But the idea is that at some point a developer is going to leave and it, you're, it's a high risk thing if all the knowledge is trapped inside of that developer's mind. Code reviews are a great way of disseminating that knowledge across the entire system. Um, code reviews are a good way to make engineering decisions. 
in a good effective team will usually have thought about these things in advance. They'll have some, some, uh, oh, in some architecture sessions ahead of time. They'll have some documentation that describes their, their architecture patterns, how they're going to access data, what kind of testing they're going to do, what are their coding standards going to be. But sometimes they miss things. And during the course of a code review, those things get highlighted. Uh, because those are some of the things that they're not documented well that tend to cause conflict within between the, the reviewer and the author. Uh, addressing weakness, of course, addressing weakness in the code, if the code's not doing what we're supposed to do. I think that was the very first thing when we validated, but also addressing weaknesses in developers. You know, reviewers are often developers as well, and they can teach something to the code author. Maybe the author doesn't know about certain design patterns or architectural patterns, or they don't know about libraries that exist that can do things more efficiently. Um, this is a way to transmit knowledge between the reviewer and the code author. Uh, maintaining consistency because you've got a lot of people looking at the code at the same time, then the code tends to Adapt the, adopt the same naming conventions, the same libraries, the same patterns, the same algorithms. Uh, and as a consistent code becomes a lot more maintainable, a lot easier to maintain, a lot less costly to maintain. Um, there's all sorts of things. Oh gosh, I have, I have notes over here. The size and the separation of the projects, the classes, the methods, rules about header commas, all sorts of things that more the more consistent they are, the better off than, than the more, uh, the cheaper and easier it is going to be to maintain a code base in the long run. And then compliance also is a big one as well. Compliance, there's internal compliance. Maybe we have rules that the, the, the code base has to adhere to, but there's also some CMI, CMMI maturity levels and ISO certifications some external authorities that will certify your development shop. And in order to be certified, you have to have certain rules in place about how your code is developed, written, deployed, and so on, tested, et cetera. And code reviews help to enforce that. And those are all short-term benefits, but there's also a lot of long-term benefits as well. Um, a big one is that uh, we, work, we can catch problems sooner. That's what we saw in the Joe and Jack example, is don't let the users catch it. Let's let's check these things out. Let's, let's find a problem before it goes out to the user. Um, by doing so, we can reduce the amount of rework that we have to do. Uh, we can reduce the amount of service calls we have to do with the customer. Uh, we have fewer integrate, fewer issues downstream with integration test, testing, user acceptance testing. The further, uh, we say call this the shift left principle. The further left, the, the sooner that we can catch a problem and correct that problem, the easier and the cheaper it is. There's a picture of the shift left principle, the, so the cost of software change. I know I recognize that there are no numbers on these axes, but the principle is, is clear that the longer after you write the code, the more expensive it is to fix any problems that you find. And here's a few examples in here that like, uh, if I'm writing a line of code and I realize that I've spelled something wrong and I backspace and I fix it, that probably cost me a nickel to change that. But if somebody, if it goes to production and a bug is found, and as a result of that bug, an airplane falls out of the sky, that, that's millions of dollars that of, uh, of airplane hardware and software changes and lawsuits. Uh, and in between there, of course, is a wide spectrum of things here. So this is uh, this whole shift left principle just states that as you the longer you wait, the more uh, you know the the the, the the cost of fixing any problems goes up exponentially. <clears throat> and in fact, I would suggest that, um, uh, you know, we talk about code reviews here. You can actually shift this even further left and have things like pair programming or mob programming that are, that'll, that are, uh, are effective at catching issues even before it goes through the code review process. Now we're really talk not talking about this presentation, but the idea of shifting left is, is really a good principle. All right, so yeah, I think after all that stuff, you would think everybody is doing code reviews because they're awesome. They have all these advantages. My experience is no, they're, they're, they're not. There's a lot of organizations out there that are not implementing code reviews and there's reasons why. You know, they take time, they take energy, they take uh, communication problems. So let me, let me, uh, this is a partial list. This is, let's see, challenges for the author and reviewer. 
Uh, this is challenges between both author and reviewer. I can't remember now if I have slides on each of these. You want to jump ahead really quickly. Yeah, there we go. Okay, let's let's uh, let's talk about it. So number one, they do take time, and they do take energy. And we none of us has an unlimited amount of either one of those things. So the time you spend reviewing code is time that you're not spent doing something else, like generating or adding new features to the software, fixing bugs, things like that. Um, they also take energy. You know, we we uh, you've got to be focused on doing this, and you know we can't be working uh, going at 110 percent. 20 hours a day, that's just, you know, we have to take breaks sometimes. Um, reviews are often uh, a blocker to other changes. So if we've got a review that's taking a while or ping-ponging back and forth between the author and the reviewer, it can hold up other development. And that's a challenge. And a lot of people will, will not do reviews for that reason. They need to move forward constantly. A big one, a big challenge is miscommunication. And the reason is because in most organizations with, with I've worked, uh, code reviews are not done in person. They are done asynchronously and the communication is therefore done through writing up a change list and sending back, typing in the, the issues that are found. The communication is hard enough when it's face-to-face, -face, but when it's nonverbal like that, when it's uh, just, just words typed in, it can be even worse because it's hard to get the context to that. Um, there's also the issue that different people have different opinions. I, as the author, may think that this is the way the code should be implemented. This is the way it should work. You, as the reviewer, may have a completely different opinion. Maybe we're both right. Maybe they both work, but sometimes that can cause a lot of conflict. Uh, and uh, and then we have this issue of, of individual accomplishments versus collaboration. And I, I actually... Uh, point to the our education, our U.S. educational system as a as a culprit in this. In the U.S. educational system, a lot of emphasis is put on your individual grades. You know, what did you do? What is uh, you have to turn your assignment in without looking at anybody else's work? Uh, but in a software organization, um, sometimes it's better to just collaborate. And if you think about you, the code developer, and the code author, uh, code author and the code reviewer as being collaborative on this. Than, and having shared ownership of your code, um, that's a different mindset. And a lot of people have an issue with that. As I say, I think it comes out of our educational system that we, we we tend to take pride in our code. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I, if I write a really good piece of code, I, I want to point to it. I want to show it off. I want to take it to a user group and do a presentation on it. Um, and some people think that if other people are contributing to that code, it sort of dilutes my accomplishment. It's It's not an insignificant thing. All right, this is the author and the reviewer. Both will have issues. These are issues that are stand in the way. They're speed bumps them. If it's just the reviewer, uh, one of them is uh, a lot of folks just don't feel comfortable pointing out errors in anybody else's code. You know, particularly if the, the, somebody's been working on a code base for a long time, who am I to criticize your code? That you know, you you know the language better, you know the business rules better, you know the code base better. You've worked on it for a letter. That I might be a little hesitant to interject my opinion because I don't really feel that my opinion is as valid as yours. Um, the other thing is that the code reviews not only do they take time, but often they stop what you're doing right now. You have to interrupt. You have to schedule time for them. And in a lot of organizations, the reviewer is also a developer. So if I'm in the middle of writing a feature and I've got to stop some time and do a code review, then I have to get back into that mindset of what was that we're doing in that feature, get everything back in my head. And that is a that is a problem. That is a challenge uh, that uh, that interrupts it. That, that, that discourages people sometimes from doing code reviews. Uh, code author, um, this comes down to communication. A lot of times criticism can be taken personally. You know, we as developers feel ownership in our code. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. We feel, well, we should, you should take pride in your work. But some, sometimes people tend to internalize that. And they think, you know, if you're criticizing my code, you're criticizing me, you're criticizing my value as a developer. There's nothing wrong with this code. I wrote it and I'm awesome. Uh, and uh, and it's kind of hard to overcome that to to face that and some of that is the the part the part of I see somebody look there you are not your code uh, a developer knows how not to break their code <laughs> but anyway they um 
uh, and sometimes that's the reviewer's fault. Sometimes the reviewer can be really harsh. Not everybody is like awesome at communication like you and me. <laughs> Some people just are really bad at delivering a message and they, <laughs> Uh, they make it sound like they're attacking you personally, um, and this is a challenge. Even, but even if they're not, some people just it's it's kind of natural to think, oh, you're attacking my code, you're attacking me. Uh, the other is uh, in some organizations, there uh, people the management will keep track of bugs, the number of bugs that each developer has created, and even if they're not, there's often a fear in developers that they might be doing that, and so. If that's the case, you, you want to hide the bugs. You don't want the reviewer to find them because there's a penalty for that. It's silly. We shouldn't be doing that. But it does happen, and even if it doesn't, sometimes we think that it's happening. So these are all challenges, and a lot of them are really valid challenges, reasons why you might not want to implement a code review system in your organization. But um, I would suggest that the advantages definitely outweigh the challenges. And... There are ways that we can overcome many of those challenges. We can. Uh, it looks like I have a some audio recorded on this slide by mistake. Hmm. Tell, tell me, hey, Sean, tell me if you hear audio when I do this. The good news is that we can make it. Yeah, we can hear it. Oh, my gosh. I must have accidentally recorded some. How do I mute that here? Uh, on a slideshow. There must be a way as I'm sharing this slide. Here, Rick, last view, so camera help, pause. All right, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I think it's just this one slide, hopefully. And this is slide number 25. So I am going to do for one slide, just drag this over here. Like that, and say that the good news is we can address these challenges and we can make our code better. All right, let's <laughs> let's see if it works when I go to the next slide and I still have that audio. Yeah, David, I, I got uh teased because I, I didn't point it out that uh, you should have code reviewed or had your uh, <laughs> slides code reviewed but uh mm. anyway you guys are my reviewers <laughs> i'm testing in yeah. i'm testing in production is there anything wrong with that <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, i don't know if we're the great group for that or the wrong <laughs> <laughs> oh i know how i could do it actually i probably should do this right now there's somewhere on here is under record there's a uh uh, I don't even see it. Is this, should there be like a little icon that says that there's voice on that one? Uh, I was going to just delete that. Oh, here it is. I see it down here. So I can right click, I think, and just say delete. Yeah, drag this out of the way. Here, I'm gonna, I'll, sh I'll show you guys what I'm doing. This is just a little PowerPoint. So what probably somewhere along the way I was practicing right here and I recorded this slide right here. And that's what that is. That's what you heard. And I think if I just grab that and press delete. Oh, there. So now it's gone. And it looks like there isn't one on these other ones here. Okay, good. All right. That was my change set. I'll submit that for another PR later on. <laughs> Go ahead and submit the pull request. I'll approve it. <laughs> All right. Where was I? All right. Good time for a quick review. How can we can we have some good ways we can be better? All right. All right. So there's uh, there's I said there were two parties. Um, there's actually a third party I haven't talked about yet, but there are two primary parties in the code review process, the reviewer and the author. And I want to start talking about the reviewer first and what the reviewer can do to make the pr whole process better, which is uh, number one is uh, don't delay. The, the faster you, you can get, um, get to this code review, then the faster you can get your list of issues back to the developer, the faster they can start working on it. The big advantage of this is that when they, they can get working on things faster, then there's less time between the original code authoring and the addressing of your issues. Um, and that's a big deal because, you know, we forget things. We start to, you know, we don't have that context in our mind anymore. Maybe we've changed the code since then, so we have to, uh, do a different branch and then merge things back together again. The longer you wait, the more the whole process becomes just just more difficult. Now, having said that, I, I totally recognize that there's uh, 
it's not always possible. But I mentioned earlier that you can't just drop everything in the middle of writing a, your own feature and immediately, as soon as a pull request comes in, start working on that. You've got to plan these things out. But it's you definitely should be keeping this in mind, that there is a penalty for delaying these things. The, the sooner you can get back to it, the better it is in the long run, at least for this bit of code. All right, and then let's see where we go here. Uh, use the computer. The computer is is your friend, and it can do a, it can automate a lot of tasks. You can use a linter. You can of course you can use a compiler. So the first thing you should do is bring the code down to your machine, make sure it compiles, uh, run all the automated unit tests, all the automated integration tests, anything that's automated. Use that. Tools like um, uh, like linting tools. There are styling tools depending upon the the language you're using. There's a .NET code formatter and uh, um, Oh, there was some for Java and JavaScript and PHP and Python. They're all they're all out there. Automated tools that'll check. So if you've got naming conventions already, you can or just styling conventions, use it for that. Don't waste your time on things that the computer could do better. Uh, and a good idea is to do this first. And if it doesn't match the basic standards of it, just send it back. There's really no point. You know it's going to get rejected. Uh, just stop right there and. If it doesn't match your standards, let's let's get the simple stuff out of the way. And it, really, there's no excuse for that because the developer has access to those exact same tools, and they should be running. When I get to the point where I part where I say, "What can the developer do better?" They'll have all the same slide here. Use the computer, automate that stuff beforehand. All right. Um, along those lines, create a style guide in advance. There's no point. There's too many arguments over whether we should use tabs or spaces or camel case or Pascal case or whatever. Um, have that in advance. It might not cover everything. It's a it's a living document and it can evolve over time. But at least get a start on it. And you don't have to create it all from scratch. You can go right here if you go to this link right here. I haven't been there for a while, but um, there's a, a bunch of depending upon what language you're in. I mostly do C sharp, so you can just take this, download, save it and then edit it. Uh, you don't have to agree with everything. Just go through it, figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, oh, I didn't, it's over here, sorry. I'm sharing this screen right here. In fact, when I clicked the link, it, it came to here, style guides, and Google's already done a lot of the homework for you. So let's say you're, an, you're a JavaScript developer, come in here and save this somewhere on your server, share it with everyone. And, but before you do, just Make sure you agree with it. You know, you may, the, you know, maybe the um, export statements might be something different here. All right. All right, let's go. Let's back to here. Uh, working high level to low level. What this means is that uh, high level means these, the things like the, uh, the structure of the classes, the, the, um, the folder hierarchy, uh, the interface declarations. Low level is the actual lines of code themselves. Always start at the high level. Sometimes when you find issue, when you correct issues in the high level of the code, the low level stuff sort of works its way out. So if you start down low, the, the reverse is never true. If you're changing lines of code, it's never going to resolve problems about the structure of the application. So always start high level and work down to low level. Um, as a reviewer, it really helps to include code samples. If uh, even if it's just pseudo code, uh, don't. Don't assume that the developer knows everything that you know. Um, and uh, so a little bit of coding will help either write it, point to it online. Um, a, a word of caution on this, code samples would be uh, things that would make, thing, make, your, make the code more efficient. So like for something that would significantly reduce the lines of code would be a great place to point to code samples. I mean, don't, don't overdo this. If you start overdoing it, then the author thinks that you don't trust them to write the code, that you're actually writing the code for them. That's not really a good use of your time, and it probably might poison the relationship a little bit if you do that. So there is a balance to that. And, and speaking about poisoning relationships, this is, this is a big problem. I'm going to come back to communication over and over again. Do not make it personal. As you're writing up your list of issues, avoid saying you. Phrase things as request rather than command. Phrase things as, or cite principles rather than just stating opinions. So a couple of examples of this. So um, it's, instead of saying uh, you returned the wrong value in this method, say this method should return value X, but currently it returns value Y. Now you're not 
criticizing the author, you're, you're, you're talking about the code instead. Um, the um, frame feedback is requests. Um, instead of this method is too long, shorten it. A better way is consider shortening this method. Just a little bit softer. Um, I'm not a big fan of the passive voice in writing, but sometimes using the passive voice can, in fact, soften the message you're delivering. Um, and then tying notes to principles rather than opinion, um, you could say this class is too long. It it uh, it should be less than a thousand lines. Uh, that just sounds like an opinion. Maybe you should say uh, something better would be this class should be split into two classes because it two it, it does two different things and violates the single responsibility principle. Now you're not just stating opinion, you're, you're pointing to some actual principle that justifies what your recommendation is. It's easy to argue an opinion, but uh, it's kind of hard to argue the single responsibility principle. Um, this is what I just learned recently, previewing review comments with labels. Uh, the the issue and suggestion, uh, just I have a couple of examples here, but I'll come back to that in a second. I just wanted to find these, uh, this idea of issues and suggestions. I mean, actually, I'll jump right here. Um, these usually come together. Uh, so issue, this method does two things. I just brought this example up. But here, the issue is that it does two things that violate single single responsibility principle. Suggestion, consider splitting this into two methods. So these are things that are... Uh, the, mostly we think about what a code review is going to be. But sometimes we're not really sure if if this is a problem or not. So you might just put it in the question. It might not be a call to action. I just want to know, why did you choose the array list instead of the list class? Maybe there's a good reason for that. In my opinion, the array list seemed more valid. I just want to hear your example, your, your explanation of this. Uh, a knit is a really small thing, that, but it's, it's required. Um, like uh, a better name for a method, for example. And you're just acknowledging that it's a small thing, but it's, it is a suggestion that should be done. A chore is also required, but it's just a pain in the neck and you're acknowledging that. Remove unused import statements. Go out and do that, sure. <laughs> uh, a thought is not something that needs to be done. It's just an idea, it's a suggestion, something for them to think about. It's not gonna hold up the code review. It, if they don't address it, you can still, approve it and merge it with the network, but just something that you're trying to educate them. Here's a library that does this for you rather than you can eliminate all this code. Uh, and then the last one, I had never really thought about this before, but you can include praise in your code review. If you see something that's really clever, something that they've done really well, it's okay to add that into the code review. And this makes it clear. So these prefixes makes it clear what exactly each one of these statements is doing. Uh, so praising, I've, I've started, I read about this, uh, it's probably about 18 months ago that I first read this in, uh, in an article, this one down here that I've linked. I've got a bunch of links at the end of this, but, um, uh, so, so, and ever since then, every time I do a code review, I look for things to praise. Uh, however, a word of caution, praise sincerely. Don't just say, good job in general. Don't praise things that really don't deserve to be called out. Just look for things that are really well done and do that. Don't force it. Insincere praise, it's hollow, it accomplishes nothing. It probably does more harm than good because then they're not going to listen to your praise later on. And so is vague praise, you know. Um, the calculation runs much faster, is much better praise than say, great job, great code. <laughs> Being specific is really important in praise. That's good advice in life as well. It's uh, just not just in code reviews. All right, one more thing. Uh, consider the, co the scope of the code review. Um, we want to uh, resist the temptation to review more than the change set. You have a change list in front of you. As much as possible, you want to st stick to that. So avoid feedback on lines that did not change. Uh, the, an exception is uh, if it's really trivial, you know, you see a spelling error somewhere, you could probably put something in there about that. Um, or if you see uh, if the, the, the lines of code that changed actually ex affected something else, which happens sometimes, maybe they've changed a, a, a function so it does something new and they should actually change the name of that function. That might be one thing, something like that. But it, in general, if um, 
it, it's really tempting sometimes to spelunk through the code and find other problems and put those into your it, it list of issues. And that's going to expand the scope of it. That's going to protract the length of the code review. And uh, that's probably not a good idea in general. All right, this is something that all, always happens eventually is you get stalemates. What happens is that <clears throat> we get this, I talk, talked about this ping pong back and forth between the developer, the author, and the reviewer that uh, they'll, the author will submit a pull request, the reviewer will send some, uh, some issues back, the author will say, this is not a bug, it's a feature. The reviewer will say, no, it's not a feature, it's a bug. And you'll get into a stalemate where no, neither one wants to back down and there's no progress. And this is really a challenge. There's, uh, it, it holds up the code review so you don't make any progress. Sometimes it holds up other, uh, other parts of the application as well because you're spending all this time on this thing. And, and also it creates tension within the organization. If this thing goes back and forth, then there can be some resentment back between the two. All right, so how do we do this? <laughs> how do we address this? There's a few ways we can do this, and this is probably the order in which you want to do this. Number one is discuss it. Most of the time, code reviews are done asynchronously over written communication. If you're in the same office, you know, get up from your cubicle, get up from your desk, walk over, and sit down and just talk about it. Maybe you're both right. Or maybe you, there's something that you're not seeing the other person has. Just have a face-to-face -face conversation. Eliminate some of the nonverbal, uh, the problems with nonverbal communication. If that doesn't work, maybe we need design review. Let's go into a room and a whiteboard. This is probably something, often this is a problem that uh, wasn't addressed in the architecture design, the original architecture design, and we need to rethink that. So get get in a room and just start figuring out the best way to do that. Maybe maybe bring an architect into that discussion. Uh, another thing is just concede, uh, consider yourself, is this a hill that I want to die on? And um, it's, it, ask yourself, yeah, I know I'm right, but are they also right? Or even if I'm more right than they are, what are the consequences of conceding and letting them move? Is it, is it, is the code gonna self-destruct? Are puppies gonna die? You know, what, sometimes it, it's better just to succeed, just to concede. Uh, and finally, if you really at a roadblock, escalate it. Bring in the manager and talk about that and say, all right, we can't agree, you decide. But that's the last reward. These, these are the things that you should do in, in the order that you should do them. And um, always keep in mind that the goal is to improve the code. As a reviewer, it's tempting to hold up a pull request until every single issue has been resolved. And if there are a lot of issues, that can be a problem. Sometimes it's okay just to make the code better. And uh, I've heard this phrased as you want, if you get code that's like a C minus, maybe you wanna bring it up to a C plus or a B minus. And then the next time bring it up from a B minus to a B plus and so on. because um, when you have code that has a lot of issues, then you, sometimes it's necessary to, to, to prioritize those issues and decide, you know what, we're going to let these go now because it's not going to destroy the code. It's not, they're, they're, they're issues, but they're not issues that are likely to, they're likely to be catastrophic. And uh, it's okay to approve a pull request if only trivial issues remain. Uh, if an issue... If a code review has a lot of issues, maybe it makes sense to split it into multiple pull requests. All right, a couple other just this one, tips here. Uh, avoid repeating feedback. You know, um, if you've got one comment, sometimes you'll see the same issue multiple times. You can just say see above, just a shorthand for doing that. Let's see. Um, Set aside some time for the code review. Don't rush through it. Code reviews are really important. Um, I would recommend never doing more than 500 lines of code per hour um, and uh, limiting your reviews to an hour at a time. You, you burn through a lot of mental energy trying to read and understand and critique other people's code. Be aware of that. Don't, don't try to rush through it. And then I keep coming back to this, communicate clearly, uh, 
code reviews are written, they, they, they tend to be done through written communication. So as a reviewer, you're going to be writing a list of issues. Think about what you're writing, write a clear description of those issues. I think uh, my browser now comes up with um, suggestions when I spell something wrong or if it's good grammatical errors, but, but really communication is hard enough without you making it harder by having bad grammar or unclear context. Read what you've written before you send it back to the author. All right, that's the reviewer. Um, here's just a high level, the, I think the high points of it, this high to level to low level concept approach to it. Um, think about the goals and the scope of the review. Don't expand it beyond the actual code that's changing other than a couple of minor exceptions. And then this, this is probably the most important. I probably have these in the wrong order. <laughs> Don't make it personal. Make it an effort <clears throat> to communicate in a way that isn't attacking the developer, the code author. All right, I'm gonna pause right there, see if there are any questions so far. All right, silence is, no. Yeah, we're, we're good here. Um, the, um, we're having a little bit of internet connection problems here at the uh, campus. Oh no. Um, so when you're talking about don't make it personal, that's where that statement I've heard uh, by a friend of mine out in Dallas, um, you are not your code. So if you have somebody coming behind you, editing your code, making different suggestions, things like that, don't take that personally. It's still for the same goal of making the code better. And, but it's, but it's also okay to go back and challenge going, why did you change that code? And maybe you're, you're learning from each other. Maybe you were right all along um, and the code goes back, but at least you have that conversation, but you don't take it personally. Uh, so anyway, that's where that comment came from that I posted earlier. To totally agree. Now, so far, I've only been talking about the, what the code reviewer has to do, and of course, they shouldn't take it personally. But really, they're not. It's not their codes being reviewed. But the message to the reviewer is: don't make it personal. Don't <laughs> don't come across as if you're attacking them. There's ways you can do that in language, like avoiding you and <laughs> and those are that's a, that's a really good point. And I I'm going to be like everybody else to say you did this, you did that, you returned this value, you know, things like that. Your method. I'm going to be in the same boat going, I need to change that phrasing. Yeah. This method returns X, it should return Y things. Um, so, but I definitely agree. That's a good reminder to be careful of our phrasing because again, we don't want to be attacked. So be conscious of that, of the, that language. So that's a very good point. Yep. Um, all right. So we talked about what the uh, code reviewer can do. Now we're going to talk about what the code author can do to make this would process better. And uh, number one is uh, be a reviewer. <laughs> Review your own code first. Um, of course, make sure it compiles, run all the unit tests, run it through the linter and run through all the style cop things, whatever you can do. Uh, look for spelling errors. Just make sure that you're, you know, think about things that the reviewer might be doing and then might be looking for, and look for those things yourself. Uh, and test, test before you submit, test your code manually, uh, create and run your automated tests, which can be unit tests, integration tests, end to end tests, and correct any issues that are found in those tests before you submit a, uh, a pull request. This sounds like common sense, but it's, I've seen people that just, they just get, people get lazy. Um, and then you use the computer. It's the same thing that I said with, uh, when you're reviewing the code, use the computer what it's good for. You have a compiler, you have uh, automated unit test, you have linters, you have a test runner, you have uh, style cop uh, tools. Use those, run them before you submit a full pull request. Just eh, don't submit crap, I guess is the <laughs> thing here. There's a lot of simple things that you can catch before you submit a pull request. Um, Take your time to write a good description of what your code is going to do. So the the change list should include uh, what your you know what what the goal was, what feature you're implementing, what bug you're fixing, and um, anything beyond that. And step back and make sure it's clear. If you didn't, if somebody read this that wasn't familiar with the code base or the business rules, would they understand it? Uh, and this is part of responding with to communicate communicating clearly. Um, one, another piece of this is that 
if you're, um, it's better to add too much context than too little. For example, um, listing the frameworks involved or why are we using this API? Um, the reviewer might, not have, might have, not have familiarity with the project. So adding that context can really help. Um, communication is difficult and miscommunication sometimes is dangerous. Uh, confirm your assumptions. For example, if you find that your code is slow, confirm that speed is an important part of this application. You know, this is, uh, this one, I should, probably should add this one to the reviewer as well. That, but um, know what what you're changing here. You know, are you, are you really gonna waste time writing code that fixes, that, that makes something 10 times faster when this thing is only being called once and changing from a millisecond to a centisecond isn't really that big a deal. Keep your change set small. This is, I see this violated all the time. Um, they should be scoped to one feature, one bug, maybe one part of a feature. Um, they shouldn't be this, I, I, I've seen the rule of thumb that 400 lines of code is enough. Anything more than 400 lines of code is a, is a smell. And when you start submitting things, you find yourself submitting things that are more than that, then think about maybe this should be split into two pull requests, into two change sets. Um, and because when it's get too big, they exponentially slow, they, well, they can do one of two things. One, they can slow down the whole review process, and that's a challenge. Sometimes exponentially slow it down. And the other thing is once you get these things too big, reviewers, it's hard, it's so hard to, to, to uh, review such a large pull request that they may not take as much time and they may not be as thorough as they need to be. So keeping it smaller will reveal better results. And one way to do that is to narrow the focus of your changes. One issue, one feature, one bug fix per change request. Even if it's only a line of code, that's all right. I've, I've submitted many pull requests that were just one line of code. Uh, separating functional and non-functional changes uh, into separate pull requests, that's a really good idea. Um, the, the kind of the canonical result is that I want to refactor this code, uh, maybe changing tabs to spaces, uh, whatever, just, but refactoring code tends to change every single line of code, whereas functional changes, you know, changing the, fixing a bug, uh, fixing the calculation tends to be just a few lines of code. Well, if you're using any kind of comparison software, like what's built into GitHub or Azure DevOps, where it's seeing which lines of code changes and mixed in with your functional change is also a refactoring of code, which means every single line changes. It's hard to find out exactly what those functional changes are. And here's we're gonna come back to stay cool. <laughs> respond graciously. Uh, the reviewer, the reviewer is on your side. You both are on the same side. Um, your goal is to produce quality software. So feedback is an important part of that. So keep cool, even if the reviewer is kind of a jerk, if they haven't seen this slide deck and they're saying you, <laughs> still keep cool, recognize that. And keep cool, even when the reviewer is mistaken. Sometimes the reviewer makes a mistake. They say, hey, the code should do this. And it actually does that. And you may look at it and say, you know, you're wrong. It doesn't do that. And, you know, one takeaway from that is maybe if the reviewer is mistaken, maybe there's something about the readability of the code that I can improve. Maybe they were wrong because the code isn't as self-documenting as I thought it was. Maybe it's not as maintainable as it could be. That could be an opportunity. Um, so if the user is confused by your code, go back to the code and make it self-document, refactor it, uh, change the names of things to be more descriptive, uh, eliminate that confusion. Uh, we saw this already, just like the, the reviewer, we want them to respond as quickly as possible. So there's less of this time lag between writing the code and reviewing it. Same thing when you deal with, when you get a bunch of issues back, respond as quickly as possible, then the reviewer will still have things fresh in their mind. The whole process will go more quickly. Everything will go more efficiently. Same caveat exists, of course, that there are priorities that every developer has. They have to 
work on new features. They have to respond to these issues and you manage it, but recognize that there is a penalty for delaying too long for that. And here's a, a suggestion I read in an article that said, if there's a tie, if you guys are both right, just give it to the reviewer. The reviewer should win a tie. Um, and I've seen that at least one blogger suggests that, um, that it's easier to, uh, it's easier to convince the developer to change than it is to convince the reviewer to change because the reviewer is in fact the gatekeeper. So, and uh, there is a, there's a big cost to long stalemates. So conceding here is probably a good idea if, as, long as, as long as you're both right, even if, they, even if you are more right than they are. All right, this section was a lot shorter than the reviewer's section, but there's still important things here. You know, best practices for the code author, review your code first, you know, use automated tests, the compiler, and even just reading through the code, make sure there are no uh, spelling errors or code smells that you notice. Uh, keep your reviews, Keep your change sets small and focused. I think that's a big deal that a lot of people don't think about. A lot of people violate that. Uh, keep your code readable. And then clear communication. Part of that is just writing good descriptions of what the change set is. And part of that is just uh, making sure you're not attacking the reviewer as well. And then don't take anything personally. Um, just like in real life, just like when your manager gives you feedback and it's easy to think that your manager is criticizing you, but a good manager can give you feedback, negative feedback, even if they care about you, even if they are, they're in a way that is trying to make you a better employee. Um, and that, that, that that's not something you should take offense at in a manager-employee relationship. It's not something you should take at, offense at. In a husband-wife relationship, it's not something you should take, back, take offense at in an author-reviewer situation, even though sometimes it may sound like it's being a personal attack. Uh, put a bubble around yourself. You, you are not your code. I'm going to use that line <laughs> next time I deliver this thing. All right. And th there are a few things that are both the author and the reviewer can do. Keeping this review time short, we saw that in both of them. Communication is key on both, both clear communication and respectful communication. And we should never make it personal. We should never, never take it personally. Both those things, all these things are both the author and the reviewer's responsibility. I did say that there was another party in this besides the author and the reviewer, and that is the boss, the manager. And there are some things the manager can do to make these reviews better. <clears throat> um, one thing is that uh, make sure everybody's involved in this process. So all your engineers, they're probably already authoring code. Make them also reviewing code. Make them familiar with the rest of parts of the code base. Make them familiar with the review process so they can see it from both people. And also split up that burden of reviewing code. It is kind of a chore. I mean, it takes it takes time. It takes energy. It's not fair to dump it on that one person uh, or, you know, just half of them. Uh, split that up and it will, uh, <clears throat> it'll pay dividends. You'll get more coverage for when that uh, bus or lottery ticket comes in. Uh, rotating code reviewers. It's not a good idea to have the same person reviewing the same person's code. Like if, they have, if uh, I'm reviewing Sean's code every single time, then there are things, I have a perspective and I may miss something. So, you know, maybe Todd should be reviewing Sean's code sometimes just to mix things up because he'll see things that I don't see. Um, and also it's a good idea for me to see different parts of the code base as well, to expand my knowledge of what the system does. Uh, this is, uh, if, if you're using any kind of application life cycle, management system, then um, you can set policies to force code reviews before, uh, uh, force an approval before you can merge the code with a main branch. So you should utilize that. I saw somebody just put in the chat window, there should be at least two reviewers. I don't know if I 100% agree with that. It is a good idea. And you can set that policy in both GitHub, GitHub and in Azure DevOps to say, not only do you need a review process before you can merge it, but you need two reviewers before you're allowed to merge it. Things like that can be um, uh, put in there. You can specify that every single address must be, uh, 
every single issue must be addressed in order before you can approve it and merge it with the main branch, all sorts of things you can set in here. Uh, and then I think this is the biggest one here is that you want to, as a manager, you want to foster a culture of teamwork. There's a, a, there are organizations that think of the code author and the code reviewer as adversaries. And that is wrong. That's 100% wrong. You guys, you are both working towards the same goal. That goal is to deliver quality software to your customers. And um, that isn't, even though you may have differences of opinion, keep always keep that goal in mind. And that really comes from the top. The manager has to foster that culture. So I mentioned earlier that there's one of the barriers is that there are literally organizations that will keep track of how many bugs a developer has created that had to be fixed. Well, now you've created an adversarial relationship because that reviewer, <laughs> he's finding bugs and I'm going to get penalized for all the bugs he's found. That's a problem. And here we go. Team with a good code review process is improving their code base and improving each other. This is from uh, blogger John Martin. I thought that was really good. Here's what you want to remember. The reviewer and the author have the same goals. You're on the same team. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me show you a couple of links here. If you go to this link right here, it will bring up this slide deck and in this slide deck not only are all the slides that you saw but also this slide with a further reading so you could try to write down all these links here or you could just write down uh oops where am i where is it come on there we go just write down this this link tinyurl.com slash dg slides that'll that's actually all of my presentations, but you can see that blood, sweat, and code reviews is one of them right here. And that'll have all the links in it. And uh, also I have, oh, this is me. If you want to contact me, uh, there is my email address also in the slide deck. Find me. I have a blog. I have a couple of TV shows. Technology and Friends is a um, show where I interview people about technology. I've been doing that for about almost 15 years, and then GCAS are short demos that I do just showing you how to do things in oh, just all sorts of things in technology. A lot of it's in Azure. Uh, highlight here, here's a pithy quote. Ask a programmer to review 10 lines of code, he'll find 10 issues. Ask him to do 500 lines, and he'll say it looks good. Uh, I'll show you one last thing here, which is that on my blog, I was trying to, let's, here's my blog right here and today I just published an article. This is essentially that one slide with all of the links to this. So what I'm going to do is in the meetup site, I'm going to put a couple of links in there. Let's do that. Meetup.com. Yeah, and I put a couple of the, of your links in the chat already as well. Oh, let's do it right here so that you can come back later on. That's I don't know great. how I don't know how that if that um chat persists links there's uh that blog post uh here is my slide deck right there and if i go up to here these are those are all my slides and what else do i want to do? oh let me do uh i here's just i gotta show off i got the camera I can't not show off. So this is my, uh, I've got 751 episodes of this show right here. And you, but I don't think I have anyone from Oklahoma on the show yet. I'm not sure if that's we true. Can, we'll have to fix that. You, you got my Actually, boss. I do. Do you know uh, Jason Street? I don't. Uh, he lives somewhere in Oklahoma. He's an amazing speaker. And I, uh, we'll talk oh. about later. I'll, I'll try to connect you. Um, I'm not sure where he lives in Oklahoma, but uh, let me let me uh, put okay. this in here. This is let me go back. I was to just uh, I was just drinking with Eldert uh, in Seattle. Hey. Oh, good man! I just met him at Code Mash for the first time. I a good guy. Um, yeah, he is. And uh, I just how did I lose the meetup site? <laughs> I'll put some more links in here. Wait, it must be out here somewhere. Did I? It would have told me meetup. 
Oh, here it is right here. So there's this one, HTTP. I've got a, I don't have a certificate on this yet, so please, but all it does is direct to a YouTube channel. And this other one, here is my other show. And this is, I've only got 149 episodes here, but these are just uh, like, uh, 15 minute screencasts, how to work with chat GTP, GPT, how to deploy an Azure Spring app, uh, things like that. Just um, real short videos to get you along. So that's what I'm gonna put in the chat right there. Looks like I've already hit send. So you'll have it. And oh, it turns them into links, good. Awesome, thank you, David. Thank you very much. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, somebody says, room? Jason is in Oklahoma City. Uh, how, how far is that from Tulsa? Just an hour and a half. Oh, you should call him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll it's, get, I'll get uh, Jason, Jason with a Y. I'll, I'll uh, okay. you can find him on. Well, yeah, there's a little plug for Okay, Jason awesome. Thank you, Eric. This guy right here. Fantastic speaker and a great guy. Really, really good person. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> Probably left Twitter. Okay. Well, I can get a hold of him. Oh, well, let's, let's, at least you can spell his name now. Yeah. All right. Good deal. All right, any other questions for David? You're welcome to come off mute or post them in the chat. All right, David, how, thank how, you. Oh, I, you're welcome. How many folks are in the room with you? Uh, five others. All right, cool. So yes, the small group here, and then uh, several online. Um, and I know somebody said that they were from Utah. So we definitely reach out to other states. Um, there's been times when I've seen uh, visitors from Iran, Israel, wow. Brazil, oh, uh, yeah, Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, nice. So, um, nice. so uh, David, yeah, I thought it was fantastic talk. The Thank you. because there's a lot of and we, you know, you didn't use the word psychology, but it really is. I mean, there's a lot of psychology in it. I mean, how to treat others as you want to be treated kind of thing. And, you know, you are not your code. Don't make it personal. And, um, oh, so something else too, depending on, um, not everybody's on a scrum team, but I, I highly recommend certain aspects from a scrum team. And that's a, things like a definition of done. And if you come up, even if you are your own developer, you're your own developer code reviewer, it's your product kind of thing. It's your, company of, of one employee still if you have like a, a definition of done that helps you adhere to a level of standard and a guideline uh for you to uh to, to judge your stuff by so um at the very least have something like that and even a definition of done if you're on a scrum team you'll notice that maybe that changes sprint to sprint as it evolves so it's not really set in stone but it can evolve as well so um or yes, the uh, works on my machine is is good enough for Chris. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, like so, so, anyway, all right. Any other questions before we stop the recording? Yeah, I got a question for David. Um, so, at a previous company I worked at, in our code reviews, they were all done in one big meeting. And you were saying in your speech how um, most code reviews that you've seen are done asynchronously. Um, yeah, do you see just... a benefit in doing the kind of in person as a whole team? Oh, I think it's review, well. I, I've never seen a whole team do a code review before, but I've seen I mean, like in person people, ones. So I, I have done in person ones, and there's a big advantage to that. It's just it's just not practical for a lot of organizations, and that's I think the reason they don't do it because then you have to get uh, you have to get the um, uh, the schedules lined up. Uh, they have to. They they have to be working in the same building, right? You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
but um, but the advantage, the big advantage you have is with communication. You you get real communication, immediate feedback, and all that. So that's if you could do that, that's great. Um, but that's essentially the trade off that you have is that now you're uh, not only do I have to I have to drop everything to schedule it, but so does the author. You both have to do it at the same time, and sometimes that's hard to sync up. It's almost impossible nowadays because so much um, you know I think half the workforce is remote now. I don't know what the numbers are, but more than half the people I know are working remotely. Cool. Makes sense. Thanks. That was a, a incredibly horrible flashback from 1992 where we used to sit in a room and say, so-and-so will scribe and you will read the code. <laughs> and we would literally read printed out versions of code. <laughs> it, yeah, that was horrible era. It's It reminds me of the walkthrough of a screenplay. Exactly. The actors all sit around the room. Is it like that? <laughs> 10 times as boring, but yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Any last last chance for questions? All right. Let me go ahead.